Senior Policy Advisor for COVID-19's Equity for the White House COVID-19 Response Team. Let me welcome Dr. Cameron Webb. Welcome to the Karen Hunter Show. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, you got on a Saved by Grace sweatshirt, so I figure you know what I'm talking about with the Mark of the Beast in the Bible. I do indeed. I do indeed. <laughs> All right, um, UVA Medical Center, you, you, uh, you treated patients there throughout the pandemic. So you got up close to the COVID. A lot of people don't still believe when I see Texas and Mississippi, you're just like, all right, the hell with the masks and all of this. I'm like, don't you know that the COVID-19 COVID is still there? Tell me the worst of this pandemic for you, what you experienced. Well, first off, I think I'll frame this by saying I worked in the hospital uh, taking care of COVID patients last night. So that's why I'm oh. in a shirt. I worked overnight. I just woke up uh, after after a long night shift. But what I'll say is that, you know, there have been moments and we we're in our uh, coming coming down from our third peak uh, in terms of cases here. But there have been moments where we've just had an onslaught of patients coming in. And the scariest thing, and I was telling our team this just the other day, is when we have an 18 year old coming in with every single symptom of severe COVID, uh, who's really worried about their outcomes, uh, pregnant women coming in really sick and really worried, uh, and then older individuals as well. And, and, you know, seeing folks on 15 liters of oxygen, knowing that the science isn't there yet to tell us exactly how we can help somebody who's already gotten really sick, right? Every, somebody who's really sick, who's at high risk for a really bad outcome, we only have but so many tools. We can use steroids, what, we can use remdesivir, but we, we don't have every everything that can kind of save somebody in the midst of that. And so that, as an internal medicine doctor, that's one of the most frustrating things. When we have really sick patients and we don't have, you know, the therapeutics to save their lives, we have to focus on prevention. Dr. Cameron Webb, uh, who does not look old enough to do all of the things that he's doing, but, you know, uh, with his Benjamin Button self. So um, <laughs> I'm assuming you're young because you look very young, so I'm not even going to do the Benjamin Buttons thing. What is very sick? Describe very sick. When you say an 18 year old is coming into the hospital with COVID, very sick. What, is, what does that look like? Yeah. Well, you know, and this, in, this individual I'm talking about had asthma, had a history of asthma, came in saying uh, those words that as a black American just, you know, are triggering. I can't breathe, right? And when you hear those words and you see people who look like you, who, who should be pretty healthy, doing pretty well, saying, I can't breathe, sitting with them in the waiting room as we're trying to get them moved back and saying, what can I do to help this person? That's a really frustrating and unfortunate set of circumstances. And, and then I think disproportionately, you know, in our, in our computer system, we've got pictures of our patients. And I remember back last year when we first started having COVID patients coming in, clicking through the list of COVID patients and seeing how they all looked like me and my cousins and my aunts and my uncles and my family and saying there's something going on here that we don't quite fully understand. And it's just the fact that this pandemic is built on the backs of structural inequality and systemic racism. It's built on the backs of the dynamics of folks being left behind for generations. And so now this is that moment where all of those things, this is that, that moment of reckoning. And so from a federal perspective, we have to lean in to say, not only am I going to get resources to you to address this, this immediate need, but it's time for us to address these other things as well, because we can't have people disproportionately getting sick just because of you know their their zip code or or other dynamics historically. And and I, I think it's hard for a lot of people to wrap their brains around how a disease can be racist. But I want to I want to double down a little bit on what sickness looks like. What is COVID nineteen? What is the novel coronavirus doing to that eighteen year old who can't breathe? That makes it impossible for you to help him. Because like you said, normally, you know, there's not a, a respirator. There's not, you know, the, the, the asthma pump, you know, like, why isn't that working on this? Yeah, it, it's what it does. It causes a pretty diffuse pneumonia. So it causes across your lungs, just really fills them up with a lot of kind of infectious response. One of the things about COVID is it, it really revs up your body's uh, inflammatory response system. And so in addition to the virus causing its own problems, it sends for a lot of people, their bodies into hyperdrive, sending cells to try to fight the virus. And the combination of the two is really troubling. You know, one thing that I see, so when folks say they can't breathe, it's because they're 
their lungs have effectively become a battlefield. It's the place where you have the virus and you have the body fighting the virus and there's no room for air to be exchanged to, to get oxygen to the tissues in your body. And so people go from needing you know, room air to a couple of liters of oxygen to a non-rebreather, which is a mask that we use for folks who need a lot of oxygen, to us saying, do we need to take this person to the ICU and get them intubated for them to continue to breathe? And that happens really quickly in a lot of instances with COVID, much quicker than in other conditions, normal pneumonias. And then on top of that, like I said, that inflammatory response, we'll see folks who you know, are doing okay, then suddenly they end up with clots throughout their body because that body's your body's inflammatory response is, is leading to this clotting situation. So folks will have large pulmonary embolized blockages in the pulmonary vasculature. This, this virus, that, you know, or I should say the disease caused by this virus, it is the likes of which I haven't seen. And I, I've seen a lot of things. I did my, my training in New York City. We used to say we see every disease possible when you train in New York City. And what I can say is that the COVID is such a unique dynamic because you just see people uh, get worse really quickly. And I think that not having uh, that well-worn path of resources to help uh, has been a challenge. And we have a couple more now than we used to, but, but I think still the best course is to keep people from getting sick in the first place. And, and because some people could be asymptomatic and have it and spread it. Some people can be walking around feeling fine and just lose their taste and smell it's still there, right? And so what you're walking around with that's not impacting because the majority of people are asymptomatic. You give it to your grandmother or your cousin that has asthma and it can go from zero to death really quickly. And there's not much you can do in the medical field. So the intubation, once you get to intubating somebody, that's almost like a point of no return from what I'm hearing. Well, it's, it's, that's when it's gotten pretty advanced. And what we're hoping is that we can take that pressure off of your own body to, to breathe for itself. Instead, we can help navigate some of that. We can get air to the places where we need it to go. And that only works to a certain extent. You know, we do a lot of strange things in the hospital. We ask people, you know, to flip over and, and kind of lay on their stomachs in the bed because that way air can distribute to other parts of their lungs and hopefully they can get the oxygen their tissues need. This is, like I said, it's a it's a pretty unique one. But I think the asymptomatic spread has been really challenging because, you know, when we talk about it, they think, oh, Tuskegee, Tuskegee, Tuskegee. That's not it. There, there's part of it that's just complacency. It's people saying, so vaccine confidence or vaccine hesitancy comes in three flavors. There's complacency, confidence, and convenience, which is the access piece. And on the complacency side, when folks are saying, I had COVID, I wasn't really sick, you know, didn't really feel ill, I was just fine, it's not that big of a deal, I don't know about this vaccine. That's the complacency part, right? Because it's just like their sense of how dangerous this, this uh, virus and the disease are. It's a little bit off base, the fact that it affects different people differently. And here's one thing that I think is so important, right? You can't rest on your laurels as, a, as we call it, a young invincible, saying, oh, because I'm young, because I don't have other health conditions, if I were to get COVID, it would be just fine. I can tell you for a fact, that is not true. I mean, yes, in the majority of people on averages across the population, that may be the case, but you don't want to run, you don't want to, you don't want to play that, that game of, of roulette there, right? You want to make sure that, that uh, you're protected, your family's protected, and you don't want to leave that to chance. 866-801-8255. I would love to hear from folk uh, and f folk who have been, I've seen a lot of you whose minds have been changed uh, and I'm going to raise my hand. You know, and it was Dr. Chris T. Purnell who came in to, to her story of her dad dying from COVID, her, her, you know, everybody in her family getting it and then being in the Moderna trial. And she's from Jersey, you know, so I'm like already have an affinity, but you know, we, we had an off mic conversation, we had an on mic conversation. And when she talked about the, uh, M, in, uh, the RNA, the mRNA technology, I was really excited about it because I'm like, that's futuristic. You got something that is not the virus, you know, because mostly vaccines are, will give you a little bit of the virus or whatever, and then let your body figure out how to fight it. So when you get the real thing, you're ready. I don't want a little bit of COVID because I don't know how COVID is going to react, right? So the Moderna trial, coupled with them holding back to make sure they have more people of color in there for their trial, that made me really comfortable. I wanted Moderna. Now J&J &J is out, and J&J, &J, one dose, but it gives you a little bit of the COVID. Talk about that. Yeah, I, I would... 
I, I wouldn't frame it that way. You know, I okay, think that frame it's, it, it, frame it way, how you would frame it. <laughs> the way that I would frame it is that it's using a different technology and the technology is, it's not giving you COVID. It's actually using a different kind of virus altogether, an adenovirus. It's a really, it, it's um, pretty benign. It causes a common cold typically with its usual machinery. But this adenovirus, what they've done is they, similar to mRNA vaccines, they've taken just a clip, just a piece of that, that coronavirus, that SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it's just encoding for that spike protein. And again, they're teaching that adenovirus, the common cold virus that's really good at getting into cells, teaching it how to flag to your body, hey, make uh, antibodies against this thing, this spike protein. And so it's kind of, it's a different delivery mechanism to get the same message to your cells. And that message is not the full coronavirus, right? It, th what that message is, is just for that part. And that, that spike protein that we're coding for, both the messenger RNA vaccines, and, and this adenovirus viral vector vaccine, what it, that spike that it's coding for, that's the part that allows the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus to get into the cell. And so it's kind of the lock and key mechanism. And so that's what we want to teach your body how to recognize and how to fight. It does not introduce the entire COVID virus, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 virus into your body, just that spike and teaches your body how to fight it similar to the mRNA vaccine. So it's a little different mechanism, but it's the same goal to, to give your body the cheat code so it knows how to fight when, uh, if it comes into contact with a real COVID virus. We're talking with Dr. Cameron Webb. Dr. Cameron Webb, you can follow him at Dr. Cameron Webb on the Twitters. Uh, tell me your story. How did you become a doctor? I was gonna say you why, just dropped a hashtag. Oh my goodness, you're getting me some followers. So, so yeah, I, I became a, a doctor because when we always say representation matters. When I was five years old. A primary care doctor was a young black man named Dr. Timothy Yarborough. And I remember seeing a black man in a white coat and I was just like, that's it right there. I wanna serve my community like Dr. Yarborough. I wanna be in spaces to help people, you know, use science, use my mind to help my community. I became passionate about it. And, um, and, you know, moving forward, you know, knew, always knew I wanted to help people. Then you start to encounter those really incredible disparities in our healthcare system. You realize there's a social justice element. And so I say, I mean, you see my sweatshirt, Saved by Grace. There's a calling to be a healer in our society, right? And there's a calling to be in these spaces where you can help people. But sometimes the healing has to do with the individual and with the system. And that's why I also, you know, became a lawyer as well. And I think that the combination of the two allows me to do social justice wait, work. Wait, back up, back up. Which is how you have a law I, degree too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got all the student debt. All the student all right, debt. Where, where are you? Where are you from, Dr. Cameron? Spotsylvania County, Virginia. Nice and rural, in Central Virginia. I'm very um, familiar with uh, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, and it, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia now, so about an hour away. But um, but I've so, lived all over. So which? I'm, I'm sorry. Which did you get first, the medical degree or the law degree? Got them at the same time. It was a seven year combined degree. So I started med school first, I finished law school first, but, um, but got both degrees over those seven years. And so it was a, it was a trek, but it was worth it. I, lo I'm, I absolutely love that um, because it's, you, you go into medicine, you get the knowledge so that you can, you help people, but then the social justice piece, you need to understand the laws that we're working under. So, which is, uh, you're, you're part of this pandemic response is COVID-19 response team with the White House, um, senior policy advisor, senior policy advisor. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, have you had the v vaccine yourself? And what are you telling your family? Yeah, so I've had the vaccine myself. I actually, um, you know, I went to get it as soon as I possibly could. It was important. You know, my wife is an emergency doctor, my wife Leanne, and I'm an internist. And so for both of us, we've been on the front lines since last March. And I think it was important for us, you know, for our kids, for our peace of mind, to know that in addition to the N95 respirators, in addition to the face shields, the eyewear, the, the gloves and the gowns, we had this additional layer of immunologic protection, and it gave us some peace of mind. I think that's been that's been helpful and important. And I'll tell you, my, my mom just turned, uh, I shouldn't say she's gonna get mad at me, but she turned 65 this year. So she was eligible uh, for, for the COVID vaccine and went and got it the first day she possibly could. And my dad got it the next day. Uh, and so both of my parents, and it's funny because uh, I was actually on a panel with Dr. Chris Cornell the other day, and I mentioned, you know, my mama got that vaccine, so you know, you know I believe in it. If, if, with all my training, with all my background, with the fact that I work in a coronavirus unit, and I know what's at stake, 
and I look at this vaccine and the data behind it, the research that's been done, the way that people who look like me were included in the trials, and the way that ultimately we think it can save lives and prevent hospitalizations, and there wasn't even a hesitation. So my parents have received it. I, my siblings, I have a sister who's a nurse, uh, another sister who's a teacher. They both received their vaccines as well. So, so uh, the webs, we're pretty vaccinated, and we're, we're getting there. We're not at 100% yet uh, because we still have some folks who aren't eligible, like in a lot of communities. But um, but I, you know, I think uh, always encouraging people to, I'm not here to sell vaccines. What I'm here to do is to share information and allow people to make good decisions. And I think it's always a good decision to protect yourself. And I think that's what people are doing. Listen, um, you know, my biggest, the other thing besides Dr. Christy Purnell was watching all the white folk go into black neighborhoods to get it and get on airplanes and go into black neighborhoods to get it. And I said, oh, they understand how important it is. They're coming into our neighborhoods to get this vaccine because they can't get it where they are. Ha, huh, okay, I see you. Even with the vaccine, because it's still inconclusive, uh, whether or not, even if you have the vaccine, if you can still spread it and you can still catch it. Is that correct? That's right. So, you know, I think we've got, uh, you know, of course, the different vaccine manufacturers have looked at this and it just wasn't one of the primary endpoints for the for the trials that got the vaccines approved for emergency use authorization. They were approved because of their ability to prevent death or severe illness. But in terms of just preventing the spread of COVID, you know, we don't know that for certain yet. Now, Moderna has made some statements that they think that it, it does a pretty effective job. J&J &J has made some statements they think it does a pretty effective job. That's, that's really good information, good to have, but it doesn't change the recommendations. And we do expect that the CDC is gonna come out with recommendations over the next couple of days or, or, you know, in the near term about, you know, for vaccinated individuals, what precautions do they continue to take? Because we have now, you know, a, a larger number of vaccinated individuals, but for the time being, I still wear uh, my mask. My wife still wears her mask. I think it's still really important to maintain those public health practices. So what do you say when a, t a whole state says no masks <laughs> and 12% of the people have been vaccinated, <clears throat> excuse me, vaccinated one time? Yeah, I say that I say that sometimes, you know, politics gets in the way of good, good reasoning, uh, you know, good rationale. I think the science is really sound on the value of masking um, and, and study after study after study has proven that. And so I think that, um, you know, people people are uh, you know, sometimes pushing back and saying, oh, this is impinging on my freedom. I don't think that that's the case. I think that, you know, we, we made the case time and time again that you wear a mask for yourself, yes, but also for your community. And if we want our communities to be open and thriving and we want to crush this pandemic, that's a small part to play. You know, and, and if it's a matter of not having access to a mask, we can get you a mask. <laughs> but it, it's, 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 very, it's a very low lift uh, to, to, to keep us moving forward.